I thought I'd show you this. There are two types of strategies that you can use when you learn mathematics. You can use rehearsal strategies, which are around memorizing content, learning your times tables, um, copying what the teacher says, listening hard or trying to listen hard. And then there's elaboration strategies, which are about taking your thinking and applying them to new situations and elaborating on what you know. It turns out that if you work really, really hard on the rehearsal strategies, you'll perform worse than if you did nothing. That's pretty scary, eh? I just did an international study with the OECD, and they looked at all of these countries about uh, what kind of strategies these teachers got them to teach. And New Zealand was the second to worst in the OECD, equal with Australia. And we really get learners to memorize and to practice a lot. Memorize and practice. So a lot of learners will say, yeah, you gotta work hard and you need to practice doing all this stuff. And I ask them, what do you practice? Oh, I practice the questions we were given and so on. Okay, you know, and how's that working for you? Yeah, it's okay. It turns out that these are associated with poor learning outcomes and elaboration strategies are associated with really positive learning outcomes. When we ask New Zealand learners, what work do you do? I ask them, you know, what do you need to do to learn maths? They say things like, go to the teacher and ask him or her about it. Just try and tell them what the teacher told us to do. Get a good teacher, talk to the, uh, to the tutor. Oh, what do you notice about those kinds of answers? You're relying on the teacher. teacher. Yeah, you're relying on the teacher, that's it. Yep, that's it. It reminds me of the fish analogy. Uh, give a man a fish a day, you know, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, feed him for a lifetime. These are all getting a fish strategies. And again, really good students, my friends, think that going and sitting and listening to a teacher talking to them is a really good, good thing. They think it's a good attribute, which it is a great attribute, but it's not the winning attribute for learning mathematics. You ask New Zealand uh, young adults what it means to be a good student, and they say a good student is a well-behaved student. Sits quietly, listens, doesn't play up, doesn't be cheeky. Often goes back at school, you know, the sort of the uh, life of the class and all that sort of stuff. But that's not what a good student is. A good student is a learning machine. In fact, good students can be quite annoying to teachers um, because they're at them. They want information. They want stuff now. They want things to move. They're generally the people who tend to succeed more. So there's a bit of a mind shift going on. Key points for this quick section. Learners are very sensitive to episodes of shame. Very sensitive to feeling that other people might think they're dumb and see maths as a little bit of a vulnerability, so are quite happy just to sit and stay quiet and to listen. The types of activities they believe that will result in learning, such as listening or not getting distracted, do not lend themselves to a workable action. You need an action. So they're unable to work hard even though they want to. So what if working harder could be easier? And that's what I think we're gonna explore a little bit in this next section. Wouldn't it be great if maths was just easy? And it turns out that it is very easy. I thought we'd reframe work. And part of reframing work is talking about the assessment tool, which has sort of dominated the sector so much. What I'd like us to do is take the assessment tool and just put it to the side for now, and then at the very end, we'll wrap up how that fits within this entire process of working better, or working harder, easier, if that makes sense. What is the work? Polya and Lakatos are two mathematicians. Two mathematicians, and they talk about what learning mathematics is. And they were kind of revolutionaries. It seems like they're revolutionaries until you realize that all the other mathematicians think this as well. You have maths teachers, and you have mathematicians. And here's the difference. Maths teachers are always teaching the known. Always teaching something that's already known. Three plus three, teacher knows it's six. You're trying to explore it, so you're just trying to get the right answer. Mathematicians are always searching for the unknown. Something that's out there that we don't know what it is. So it's two very different skills. Pretty much the entire education community for math said, when people learn maths, they should operate more like mathematicians, and that is to be discoverers, not learners. It's a different kind of concept. They're not reproducers of other people's knowledge, but discoverers. We should be journeying it and finding new things. Those are the two arguments 
kind of that are made within the maths education world. Once these maths is unknown and we're trying to find things we don't know what they are, so it's a journey, you're an explorer. And the other one is someone tells you what you should know, you need to lock it in, lock it down, get the next bit, get the next bit. And the more of it you know, the better you'll do. The side is very much on maths being a discovery thing. It's all about discovery. The work is to talk. That's the work. The work is simply to talk. So Lakatos, <coughs> this guy said, if you're not talking about maths, you're not doing maths. So sitting down and writing uh, equations and working through sums, that is not maths in this person's book. But what is maths is this. Making guesses and proving them wrong. Making guesses, proving them wrong. Making even better guesses and proving them wrong. So that's it. All you have to do is talk and you have to make a crazy guess. So think about the first person who speaks in a class. Usually it's the person who knows the answer. But then, you know, they've got the exact answer and everybody else stays quiet. But imagine if we valued somebody who made a crazy guess. 100. Okay. Why is it not a hundred would be the next question. Well, it's too big, you know, and off we go, we begin moving. So maths is simply making a guess and proving it wrong and making a slightly better guess. And the idea is that we slowly get closer to the truth and make more and more sophisticated guesses as we go. The Tewenika Waka that's in the Hamilton Museum is an amazing thing. Uh, it's a war canoe but I spent a lot of time looking at it, so I've just used it for this example, this ties in. I look at this walker and I think, how amazing that people traveled outside of sight of land over the ocean for days or weeks, not really knowing exactly where you're going, but heading to another piece of land. And I look at this thing and I think, how scary would that be to be in the ocean, not seeing any land, and the waves are coming and it's night, and you're rowing. I thought, that is incredible. What an incredible amount of courage to push out offshore and to go for it and to back yourself and not know whether you're going to hit that land or not, but knowing that your survival depends on you hitting that land. I imagine we're not going to be turning around halfway coming back. We're all in. I think of that courage and I think that is the courage that you need for maths. It's the same thing. And I'll give you an example. Imagine you found yourself in a sailing boat in the middle of the ocean at night, just to pretend. <coughs> and you had a vague sense that there's some land over there, but you don't know where. What do you do? You have to move, right? You have to start doing something. So you put your sail up, and you just think, I'm gonna head in that direction. So you go in this direction. And then after a while, you navigate and you realize, gee, I might be a bit off. I'm gonna uh, change my course a little bit. So you cut this way. And then after some time, you think, oh, no, no, that's right. We need to be over here. Shh. And you continue to move through a whole lot of guesses, getting more and more sophisticated with the guesses, getting closer to your target. That is what maths is. So with the help of our friend Pale, <laughs> who was a touch rugby legend, I don't know if you all knew that or not, I'm going to give you a quick mission to do, and maybe groups of three, there's some paper around, there's some pens, and I'd like you to practice the work. And the work is simply asking each other questions, making guesses, and uh, challenging those guesses. So if you could kind of arrange yourselves in groups of three, thereabouts, here is your challenge. You've been asked to put on a touch rugby tournament. And there are five teams. And given that all of those five teams are going to have to play each other, how many games will there be in total? I'm going to give you five to seven minutes to discuss that. Remember, don't stress out about the answer. Remember the work. Make a guess, prove it wrong. Make a guess. Please draw pictures. Pictures will help massively. <laughs> Sounds like the Pentagon's getting more approval. I'm not sure. <laughs> Connecting lines, probably. Hey, let me ask you a question designed to mess with your head. Is it true that if there are five teams, each team would have to play four other teams? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The first one. 
The first one, the, well, this is the question. This is the big question, it, it's a, and it's a, that's a great sailing thing, by the way. Do they all have to play forward teams, or is it decrease as they go on? Take a, just take, uh, take one minute to discuss it with the people around you. And if they do have to play, each team has to play four other teams, can that be used to work out how many games there'll be? Just have another little explore. It's always tough doing this stuff in a workshop, you know, because you're trying to speed through stuff. But I had a lady who was a, uh, you know, um, when you run workshops with tutors. You get your people who love literacy and your people who hate numeracy. You can kind of divide it like that. And this was a lady who uh, didn't enjoy numeracy and she'd been in a workshop and she was working on this. She didn't contribute a whole lot in the discussions, sitting back. And then uh, and after I asked her about the, you know, do they have to play for other people? This is what she said. She said, um, each team has to play four others. So she's, so she's right. So that's 20 games. So there's... Does that make sense? There's five teams. If each team has to play four others, then that's 20 games. But it's too many, because that's how many games the teams played. For every two teams, there's only one game. So we cut it in half. And I said, you're a genius. What you just said was, that was maths. I mean, that was the perfect thing. That was fantastic. And I can write it in a maths way, but what you've just said is an actual formula. She said that, there are five teams. Each of these teams will have to play four others. So five times four will equal 20. That's too many. But did anyone guess 20 right at the start? Oh, most people kind of go 20, 20. It's kind of an intuitive 20, 16 kind of comes up quite a bit. And the answer is 10, right? So she worked out that five times four is 20, but you'd have to cut that in half because we've got two teams playing, yes, but two teams playing is just one game. What winning looks like? Big bold guesses that start the boat moving. It's those people who yell out, they don't necessarily know the answer. You always get the people who know the answer, but it's the other group we want, the people who don't know the answer, because we want to be working in territory where we don't know where the island is, we don't know where the land is. So we just have to start making a course in that general direction. Talking, the repetition of more sophisticated guesses. The work is talking. The work is not doing equations. The work is not answering questions. The work is talking. If people could get that, it would change what this maths thing has become, which is this grueling process of trying to learn other people's stuff. But it's not that at all. And any time you use maths in the real world, often you're trying to solve problems that have no solutions. You know, they're new problems, so you have to come up with innovative solutions. Fun transitions to joy. And what I mean by that is, is there's a lot of trying to make numeracy classes fun, and I'm all for that. Numeracy should be fun, but numeracy can actually be better than fun. Numeracy can be joyful. I, I know this sounds cheesy, but I really believe it because I've felt it and I've seen it. When you begin to experience success in numeracy and in maths and you begin answering questions, there's this feeling inside you that's good. It's a good feeling. It's like, I don't know what it's like. It's not like Christmas morning. It's, it's something, there's a sense of satisfaction that you're in the game and you're playing it and you're winning. And it's addictive. And pretty soon you'll be looking for challenges, you'll be going on the internet looking for new puzzles and things. And, uh, and it's just a good thing and that's what gets people kind of the snowball rolling, you know, to get people going. It is a joy that gets people in it. It's funny because you go to numeracy classes and they're, boy, they're not joyful places, are they? They're very sober, serious places. And I think that it's not who we are. This should be the most fun, funky place you know, going on. There should be a place where people are talking and laughing and cracking up and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and finally, yeah, learners asking for more problems. You know, you know you're winning, like with Corey, if Corey is now pestering you asking for more fractions problems. Who does that, you know? People do that when they get that joy. They want new problems, they want innovative problems, they want different things, they want to go and show their family that they can do it, they want to go and get their friends to do it, they sit around and talk about it. That's the kind of stuff I think that is highly possible with numeracy and that we could be doing quite easily just with a shift 
And maybe if we kind of promote the idea that the work is talking and guessing rather than uh, answering questions and copying equations.